Hi everyone, Mike. Hi everyone, Mike and James here with uh, life and business stories or business and life stories. Uh, Mike's beaming in from another planet. There, he's uh, he's got a bit of an extraterrestrial kind of look go, um, going on. Uh, but but uh, today we are joined with uh, Disco Dave. Now I am super excited. The reason that I'm super excited is because uh, Dave combines a few of my passions: music and uh, coaching, uh, and and I love them both. And uh, and uh, Dave, welcome, mate. Welcome. Thank you. It's welcome, a pleasure welcome, to be here. Welcome. It is an absolute pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be in great conversation with great individuals, having some fun. Indeed. Indeed. That's all Indeed. about. So, uh, shall I dive in and tell a story? So, so just to prior to us um, recording this, um, I was uh, uh, music being the central theme here, uh, music and coaching and life changing and transformations. Um, I was just about to uh, tell a story. So, so my musical background is, is I am got into hard rock as I am a teenager, played in bands and whatnot, ACDC and Sex Pistols and Black Sabbath and all that teenage really important stuff and i went bark, and saw bark gigs at the moon, and, james. Uh, sorry how often did you bark at the moon james <laughs> i bark at the moon <laughs> man Aussie. Epic oh song. my goodness me oh my goodness and um that was going well and i was playing um guitar and then i'd sort of done the same as the stones and um, a zeppelin i had sort of gone well where's this music came from so, 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 kind of from ACDC, you step back to Zeppelin and Purple, and then, and then from that, you step back into the Emma Blues. So, so it was kind of a regression, but a forwards movement. And then I was working with, uh, with a uh, college mate, and um, it was a couple of years outside of college off, uh, after university. And we were doing this a landscaping gig, and he picked me up in his Ford Transit. Because back in the day, Dave, like, like, like <laughs> so, and, and like, uh, and only people from our generation will probably know this, but back in the day, there were cassette players, right? And he goes, James, what, you have what? to listen to this. Huh? <laughs> And you always carried a pencil with you. <laughs> a pencil, yeah, 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 yeah. To because uh, all the tape was 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 always getting stuck in the machine, and and then he'd eject it, and you'd pull the tape out, uh, or or pull the cassette out, and the tape just sort of followed you out, right? And uh, so you had to, yeah. So 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 anyway, he uh, put this uh, uh, cassette in, uh, press play, and it was the Chemical Brothers exit Planet Dust. Their first album, and it was seven thirty in the morning, and it was the first song on uh, on Saturday, which I think was block lock block locking beats. And I remember yeah. it was transformation. <laughs> That's it, and 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 my life changed, uh, and I sort of took this turn from the. I was like, oh my goodness, like there's this new kind of world and this new musical world, uh, 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 and that took me down an avenue of a lot of fun for five or six or seven years of, of exploring a house music and um, dance music and drum and bass and jazz bass. Yeah. So uh, that was my morning story. And, uh, and it was a transformational moment. So uh, there, uh, there we go. That's Dave, awesome. <laughs> Dave, talk to me about your, about your transformational moment. You, you, uh, you have taken me through a bit of your, a bit of your story, but, but I love this idea of, music and coaching combined and sort of a transformational journey so so yeah hey uh, can you give us a rundown and uh oh yeah I'll, I'll, uh, yeah it's funny it's uh, before i do it's funny you mentioned the chemical brothers because um my wife and i were just speaking about them the other day I don't, oh, did you yeah. ever get to see them live i did them and them a prodigy it blew my mind man it was like oh, oh. My yeah, I I was fortunate to see them live in two. Oh, when was it? Uh, two thousand and ten at oh, a okay. festival called yeah. Rock Ness on the banks of Loch Lomond, and it was just fantastic. epic. Um, yeah, fantastic. so yeah, fantastic. In, in, yeah, interesting no, connection uh, back in the day. Oh man, mm. we oh, we could just talk about music and the uh, music festivals. Uh, but, <laughs> no. There we go. <laughs> So yeah, the story, the transformational journey. Um, 
I the kind of the pivotal moment I would say um goes back to 2016 so not quite six years ago and to set the scene I am in Spain with my beautiful wife who at the time is six months pregnant with our daughter Emily and for most of the two weeks I spent kind of sat beside a pool and reading a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad and uh, brilliant book. it's a book, brilliant book. many brilliant people book. will have heard of probably brilliant read book. um yeah. and and I actually only found out I think it was two or three years after I read it that it was a fiction I actually read it as if it was a a non-fiction a true story oh, um, I thought it was <clears throat> ah yeah yeah. So every day, every day is a school day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I I read this book and it sparked a thirst for knowledge in me that I'd really yeah. lacked up until that point. I'd been, you know, particularly through my kind of like party years or how I kind of often refer to them is the years where I was being actively irresponsible and um, avoiding responsibility and. <laughs> I, yeah, got, I was in this moment of thinking about the future for the first time ever. I'd always been a yeah, kind of live for yeah. the day kind of guy, all about experiences, never really materialistic. Every time I had money, it was yeah, like, yeah. what's the next holiday trip experience, you know, going to be? And that's kind of how I lived my life from experience to experience. But knowing that I was going to be a dad, knowing yeah. that I was going to have that, kind of ultimate responsibility of parenthood it gave me the ability and the opportunity to think longer term for the first time ever and I started to think about you know some quite deep questions around what's really important to me what kind of example do I want to set for mm. my children what what do I really want to create in life yeah. and it was through that self-inquiry that I came to this insight that I need to help people for a living. Brilliant. Brilliant. And I didn't know what to do with that at the time. I was, and then started to ask myself, well, what does that mean? What can I create? I kind of understood through reading the book that in order to create wealth, being becoming an investor or an asset owner yes, yeah. is the way yeah. to do it. And then I started to think about, well, what, what business ideas could I create? What could I, you know, what what could I do from that perspective? And over months, I just couldn't come up with anything. And I was working for, I was working at home at the time. I was working for a company that sold tax avoidance schemes. And it was, it was so not aligned with what I wanted to do, but it was, it was just a job um, yeah. that I'd managed to um, get off the back of losing two jobs um, in my what would have been my kind of preferred career at the time as an internal recruiter, a corporate recruiter. Um, but there just wasn't any opportunities like that. And and I'd lost my second job on, um, well, I actually got pulled into my boss's office on my birthday, four weeks oh. before our wedding. Oh, no. And... <laughs> I'm like, what the oh, fuck man. am I supposed to do? You know, I literally was going to be flying to Ibiza for a week for my stag, yeah. and I just kind of had to decide. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna enjoy myself for the first few days, but then the rest of that time, I'm just going to be having yeah, to start yeah. creating stuff. You're creating opportunities, yeah, yeah. so I was kind of lining up conversations and interviews while I was there, um, and eventually, you know, got this job. I think it was literally the day before the wedding. I was sat on three job offers, and that was the best of the bunch. Um, but I kind of knew that it was something temporary. It was something that was just going to be a stopgap, um, because also my career up until that point had really been a series of just doing the next thing. <laughs> You know, from going yeah. back to, you know, when I was at uni, I would study the accounting finance just because that felt like the next thing to do, even though, I, you know, I'm practically minded, but I am not mm. an accountant. Um, 
And then, but then after that, it was um, recruitment. But also during that time, I'd worked in hospitality, discovered DJing, started DJing, um, and then had this career in recruitment and then moved into business development. And going back to that, um, that holiday, just a couple of months afterwards, I met up with a guy who used to be a supplier of mine when I worked for a drilling company. So he was director and shareholder of a recruitment business in Edinburgh, but an amazing guy, like full of energy, the most dedicated guy I'd ever, a person I'd ever come across, just delivered, but would just yeah. go the, way beyond the extra mile. And I just thought, I always felt I need to, stay in touch with this guy because there's something different about him. So we met, we had this lunch in Edinburgh and the way I experienced him was, it was like he'd amplified and expanded literally in front of my eyes as he downloads this 18 months of recent experience on me where he'd met his now wife. She'd introduced him to his now business partner who trained him in coaching um, he then created a business with her, taking what she was <clears throat> delivering face to face and had been for about 15 years in Edinburgh online into uh, a virtual coaching academy. Mm-hmm. And Brilliant. then how he became a dad and all this stuff had happened. And it all came out of this very esoteric experience where he'd taken part in a, a, a shamanic ritual and ayahuasca ceremony. Oh, and right experienced the death of his ego and after that knew he had to go down a different path he had to leave the business he was director shareholder of and he thought he was losing his mind he's like well what is going on he didn't understand until i guess things just started to happen and and i came out of that lunch like i felt as though someone had slipped some party favors in my drink i was so buzzing (laughs) Yeah. Like, mind was on fire just from like the possibilities and the energy from him and and he was the first person to tell me about coaching um prior to that i only knew about coaching as something you do in football or for your benefit yeah. soccer right? yeah. and suddenly it was like okay maybe this could be the thing that helps mm. me to fulfill this desire to help people this could be maybe the vehicle to help me fulfill this desire. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the end of 2017 that I then felt ready to go and say, right, I'm going to come and train with you, Ali. And I had to wait six months for the next cohort um, of the, what was called the trusted coach at the time. It's now called the transformational coach. And when I began that program, I had a high degree of skepticism, very high degree, especially because, and I remember this vividly, on the first call, the word transformation was used a lot. And my kind of left brain, the critical brain, was just quietly going, bullshit. Mm -hmm. But only because I'd never had a, a, a true experience of transformation and transformational coaching as well yeah. and at the end of the program it was five months later really intense um i said to them you know what you were absolutely right it was hands down the most impactful transformative incredible learning experience of my whole life and i learned i mean oh, if I think back to, you know, my recruitment days, you know, as a recruiter, you're a professional interviewer. You you ask yeah. questions for a living to draw yeah. out people's stories and draw out yeah. parts of their story. Well, the bits that are between the lines really is what you're looking for as a recruiter. You're looking for the truth inside of the words that they're speaking to you. So I thought I was great asking questions. I thought I was a great listener. I thought that I was really open-minded because when I was growing up, um, we're part of an armed forces family. We moved around a lot, you know, constantly transitioning from one community to the next. And 
I realized I had so much to learn on all those fronts. You know, mm. I learned that there were so many different levels to listening. There's mm. so much more, so much deeper that you can go and more expansive that you can be with questions. And even beyond that, not asking questions, mm. actually just holding the space for someone and giving someone the space to listen, to tune in to their own inner wisdom, the whisper yeah. of their inner voice. Yeah. And that was just so incredible. And so it just gave me a new way to be. Yeah. And as someone who has always had this desire to help people, but channeled it in a way that was really to offer my experience or advice, not understanding that most people are not ready for advice. They're not ready to hear yeah, it. True. Yep. And even when they are, they don't need it anymore. Yeah. Because they find their answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just learning how to slow down in the space of a conversation and like literally give yourself the space and time to think, mm -hmm. to check in, to just open up opportunities and more possibilities in your thinking, but also in the people that you're with thinking is absolutely magic. Mm -hmm. So, but the, but the greatest thing that I gained through all of that experience was a sense of purpose that I had just completely lacked up until that point. You know, mm. like I said earlier, life was just the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Literally all my life just transitioning from community to community to yeah. from job to job, career to career. And all of a sudden, the thing emerged. And the feeling that comes with that, that from unlocking a sense of purpose. Mm. You know, the kind of the energy and the certainty that I'm able to channel through that and the love I have mm -hmm. for what I do now. And not only that, in the last year in particular, rediscovering or, or connecting with the whole me, because I think partly through COVID, I hadn't been able to DJ for it was nearly 600 days. And I'd kind of been denying the sort of the disco part of me. And I had this realization um, in a virtual um, nine day program that I did with an incredible coach over in the US called Rich Lipvin, that, um, that yeah, I'd been kind of hiding parts of me. I'd been denying parts of me. And, and Rich told this story that kind of allowed me to see that where he spoke about how superheroes, almost all superheroes who wear a costume they put on their costume to become the superhero. Mm -hmm. So Bruce Wayne mm -hmm. becomes the Batman. Mm -hmm. um, Tony Stark becomes Iron Man. Mm -hmm. Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man. Yeah. Spider -Man. But Superman is the mm -hmm. only superhero yeah. who puts on a costume to hide who he is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So his costume is Clark Kent. Yeah, 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 true. So Rich then used that as a as a beautiful way to then ask the question, well, how are you then hiding your superpowers? Mm. What's Good question? Yeah, right. What's the costume that you're putting on to hide yeah, to your hide. strengths? Brilliant. And in that moment, I realized my costume was David Wynn. Yeah. Mm. Nice. What I was, um, what were you presenting to the world as David Wynn? Well, I guess I was trying to present uh, a level of professionalism that and and an image that was professional that I was believing was then the path to be successful. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But I realized that that was just bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for me, I am Disco Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it actually wasn't until my new coach challenged me on that because he 
he said to me, oh, he was actually wondering whether calling myself and kind of um, my personal brand as Disco Dave, what was that limiting me? Because disco is one genre of music. Whereas the human being me, there's a, I know there's a huge amount of depth to me because of all my experiences, because of all the work and time I've put into getting to know me at the kind of deepest, darkest levels. And after he challenged me on that, I kind of instinctively knew, no, this is right. I feel it. While it was a nickname that was given to me 20 years ago, I still had this like kind of inner knowing, but without being able to articulate why. So mm. I actually went away and did a whole bunch of research into the etymology of the word disco. And what I was surprised to learn was, first of all, that so the word disco, as in the genre of music, is short for discotheque, which is one half is disque, so French for record, and the other half is tech, bibliotech, library. So really actually means record library. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered that the Latin for, or the Latin meaning for the word disco is I learn. Mm. Mm. Wow. So I learn, receive information, I study, mm. I practice. Mm. And this blew my mind. So I was like, well, this, there could not be a more perfect name for me to own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, especially in what I do now as a as a coach, as someone who, well, I guess coaching is a label, it's a tool, um, actually more of a tool than a title. Um, but, you know, I help people to discover who they really are and draw out that kind of authentic version of themselves and and help them to live into that. It's, it's, it's self-discovery. I was like, this is just perfect this is me absolutely and now i could own it and um yeah it's been an amazing <clears throat> adventure and i call it an adventure rather than a journey on purpose because something i realized um it was probably in the last 18 months in the in the world of um the helping professions the word journey is used and is overused and I actually just find it really boring. Mm. I just kind of like thought that the word just, just the whole idea of a journey seems so boring. Mm. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. A, a to B. Where's the excitement? Yeah. 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 There's so many words like that. It's almost as if, I say sarcastically, it's almost as if one person comes up with a word that they use and everybody copies them. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just yeah. ridiculous. Totally. Yeah, and I think marketeers have um, I get a bit to answer for because they, you know, their their job is to grab our attention, and you know they they use words and they become overused vernacular and and kind of in many ways then lose their lose their power of meaning. Like even the it word is, transformation, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, huge overused, massively, especially in the corporate world as yeah, well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nobody nobody wants to be a risk taker. Risk takers get punished. Unless, mm. unless you're one of the risk takers like Bezos or Elon Musk, where you happen, you happen to hit it big through a combination of a number of things, mm. um, you know, there that's not the norm for a risk taker. So people mm. people do back away. Um, though years ago, I worked with a bunch of Scots here in Texas, and they were I don't know what part of Scotland they were from, but I don't think they ever heard the English language. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably from this neck of the woods. <laughs> we picked up we picked up a number of terms they were using, and we kept using them. Can you share some? Yeah, there was the word crivens. I still have no idea what that means. Crivens, yeah. Crivens. They yell crivens for everything. <laughs> and jinx. Uh, yeah, they had ock. We never we figured that was just a more or less a vocal sound like the Germans make sometimes. It was ock. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think the funniest one. We had an elevator that would go 14 floors. And for some reason, this particular group of Scots could not say the word 11 in such a manner that the audio receiver on the elevator could understand them. 
one of these elevators you say the floor you want and it takes you there. And wow. they would get so mad. It's like, eleven. Please state your floor. Oh, I did. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> oh dear. It's great, folks. <laughs> Oh. James is playing music for us. I know. What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to share that. So, yeah, that was, that was just hilarious. But I, I love the word disco. Um, when James first said we're talking to Disco Dave, I said, you mean the guy from Van Halen? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like 75 now. I mean, he might be available. You never know. <laughs> I know. I'm not as high profile, but hopefully more high energy. <laughs> well, you know, you can't fail to be high profile when you're standing next to Eddie Van Halen. Man. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know, you, right? You wouldn't even really have to do anything to be known. And my camera's going out again. Man, see, we're just having all kinds of fun today. <laughs> the show must go on. Um, yeah, so... How do you help people? I was really curious about the um, your website. So you help people through music, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're obviously a very sharp businessman. So I, you know, I know this isn't some ethereal woo woo <laughs> bizarro. <laughs> You've actually got experience, in, you know how to how to help monetize and all this. So how how does that help somebody discover who they really are? So okay. There's a few. There's a few different ways that I guess I could explain this. Um, where I'll begin is um, is actually with a gentleman who is widely r- regarded as the godfather of sports psychology, um, a guy called Tim Galway, and Tim wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis in 1974. And he was the first person, I believe, to um, publish the, the concept that our biggest opponent is not the person opposite us, whether you know, on a core, um, I mean, uh, if the court was the context he was using. Um, our biggest opponent is the one in our own head. We are our biggest opponent. And, and we actually have two selves. We have the we have our original self, so the self we were born to be, born into, which is full of possibility, creativity, pure love, expansiveness. And then around the age of seven, self two starts to Mm. develop. And that's the created self. And self two is really a self-defense mechanism as we start to become aware of the world and and also, I guess, um, our own fragility and um, vulnerability in the world. And then... Moving forwards, we really self too, as particularly as an adult, self to the created self, it, it holds us back. You know, it's the mm. it's the limiting beliefs, it's the stories, it's the really deep rooted thoughts that are beliefs that were created to keep us safe that ultimately hold us back from being that beautiful original self, like. Um, there's a coach in the US who who says he's got a, a beautiful way to describe this. He says we're all born as diamonds, then we get covered in shit, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then we try to varnish the shit to make it look good. But actually, what we need to do is scrape that shit away and allow that diamond to shine again. Oh man, it's beautiful. Yeah, right. And and Tim actually has an equation that, that that goes with that. And the equation that he came up with is P equals P minus I. So performance, so our ability to perform and be great, is predicated on our potential 
actually our ability to increase our potential and minus reduce interference. And interference is all the noise in our minds. We, I learned um, over the past couple of years that um, it's research has shown we have uh, between 60 and 70,000 thoughts a day, but actually more recently it's been discovered that it's about 10% of that. So about six to 7,000 thoughts a day because we have trains of thought that become thought worms. And what's incredible is 80%, in fact, it's 95% of those thoughts are repeated thoughts, and 80% on average are negative. So we're just constantly telling ourselves the same shitty, unsupportive stories. So that's why being able to reduce that interference whilst also expanding our view on what's possible, allowing us to step into our potential, that's what enables us to be great. So, so I kind of, I guess I have taken that concept into what I call an experience, because it's not, for me, it's not a, a kind of a normal coaching session or normal coaching conversation. Welcome back, James. Sorry. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't talk about you at all. Sorry. <laughs> Just uh, talking about the. Um... We're talking about your negative thought worms. Yeah. <laughs> Give us some context for the um, what I've created in, com in combining music and deep coaching. So, brilliant. brilliant. So, yeah, it's predicated on this equation that um, Tim Galway came up with performance equals potential minus interference. Love it. Love and what it. I what I realized through I guess my own personal experience and you know with music as a DJ and coaching, supporting people, and just in conversation, interested conversations with people, that music has this incredible ability to anchor us into an experience. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. The song that I often refer to in, in the context of my own experience is a song by the Cars called Drive. Mm -hmm. You know, that proper epic early 80s anthem. And when I hear that song, there's a very, very specific memory that's attached to that. And I'm mm. in, in the car with my family. It's dark, late at night. We're on a road that is street lit, and it's just either, we're either just arriving at a town that we're moving to in Germany, or we're going the opposite direction and we're moving away. And that tells me that I'm either two years old, when, um, which would be 1983 when the song came out, or I'm about four and a half, which is when we left for a year to move to um, a country called Wales. And... But there's more than the image. I get the same feeling and sensation in my body. Literally in my gut, I feel vulnerable and scared and uncertain. Mm. And it's actually sort of challenging to listen to that because the feelings, it's not a pleasant sensation. And actually, there's, there's other songs from that era that, that evoke the same kind of feeling, like 10 CC, I'm Not In Love, is one. What I realized was that, you know, we're talking over 35 years ago, that song allows me to re-experience that experience as if I was there again. Literally how it felt, seeing what I saw. That's amazing. Like, really amazing, right? And I thought, yeah. well, if music can anchor us into an experience so powerfully and allow us to re-experience an experience... So viscerally, mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. then I imagine there's something that I can do with that to, to give people an experience of their past, combining it with coaching that allows us to 
move into that space together and then I can support them in unearthing whatever interference is present for them anchored into that past experience. Wow. Um, right? It's amazing. That's, a, that's, that's really amazing. powerful. I've, uh, up until now, I've never heard anybody yeah. heard of anyone doing this. I think yeah, it's exactly. really unique. It's really amazing. Really amazing. Thank you. Because, uh, I mean, that's something so many of us struggle with. And it's just, you know, I have, I have a lot of negative thoughts every day, like everybody else. And it's like, just turn that crap off. But sometimes they sneak in, you know? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like a good football player, they sneak their way around. <laughs> they always they always find a way to get out. Definitely. <laughs> but that's that's one half of the experience. That's that, you know, with Tim Galway's equation, it's one half of the equation. The other side then is the potential. So how do we grow mm. the potential? So I thought, well, if I can use visualization then, if I can speak someone into being a version of themselves, this greatest version of themselves, an unlimited version of themselves, you know, using meditation and visualization to get them comfortable, get them relaxed, get them to use the right side of the brain, imagine, visualize, see and experience what they would be doing, where they would be, who they would be spending time with, what they would be saying, what they would be wearing, what impact they're having, what are they sensing, what are they smelling, what are they hearing, what are they feeling? And then speak that out loud and capture it. And then the clever bit is then once they're kind of there and complete with, with their ability to articulate what they've experienced, I then ask them, what's a song that expresses that version of you? Mm. Oh, wow. That's right? amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And every time a song emerges, like from deep within the subconscious, because they're there, yeah. they're already in that space. They're not yeah. using their prefrontal cortex. Yeah. They're not using the yeah. thinking brain. They've bypassed that. And that's the magic of music. Mm. Music allows yes. us to get into our body, to bypass the thinking brain, because it's the thinking brain that holds us back. The ego, mm. the egoic self, it allows us to just be. And how often do we not allow ourselves to just be, mm. get caught up in our thinking, get caught up in the drama <clears throat> of our thinking, and the unsupportive thoughts. Mm. So really, this is an experience that allows you to experience you at a really deep, authentic level to connect with the limitations that are holding you back and also allow you to experience a version of yourself that is so expanded, so expansive and possible. And then go away with that feeling because ultimately, when we're striving to create something, you know, if I, if I think in the context of, you know, masculine energy, right, the world is so over-biased on masculine energy, masculine traits, you know, we've got to succeed, we've got to build, and grow, Alpha. you know, it's all about that achievement. Mm. Right, right. But where does that actually get us you know we're so out of balance yeah because we're all you know if we're thinking in terms of energy we're all you know this is all you know this is going into eastern philosophy now you know we're all the yin the yang masculine and the feminine we are that whole and this allows us to just let go of labels let go of titles mm -hmm. let go of expectations oh, yeah. experience a version of you that is absolutely authentic because, yeah, because when we're trying to create a goal or achieve a goal, achieve something, create something, mm -hmm. the mistake we make is hanging our well-being on getting there, having created mm -hmm. it, when actually mm -hmm. all we're looking for is the feeling that's going to give us right now. And we can create that mm -hmm. right yeah. now. Yeah. So that's and, it. 
So yeah, mm-hmm. so then that place to get to becomes a place to come from. And it's so different to take action based on <clears> that <throat> feeling because by the time you then create the thing, you can actually feel fulfilled because you're already there. You're not mm-hmm. you're not relying on achieving those things to create the feelings. You've already cultivated that inside you. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Like, that's what life's about. Amazing. I, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. we've seen all, you know, I, I've done it. I know James, I've seen a number of our clients do it, fall into this trap of, uh, I don't remember who came up with the word destination addiction, but it was always like they're, <laughs> they're always looking to achieve the next thing, but they're never really happy. Mm. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the Eastern philosophy. Um, you know, I've been doing martial arts since I was six years old, right up until my wife ratted me out about my spine issues and I had to stop. But, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I've always seen that, that, that balance, right? Because sometimes mm. the toughest competitor isn't the one that's the most macho or likewise the one that's the most feminine. It's some balance in between uh, because a tough competitor is a tough competitor. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, uh, so, yeah, it, it's really interesting to hear that about music. So is there a correlation with the people that you help between what they perceive as being their favorite song or favorite songs versus the one that's the one that is really the one that should be anchoring to for their uh, self too, or whatever you called it. Well, what um, actually, before I kind of answer that, I, I want to pick up on a point that you just made around, you know, I forgot the term that you used about destination. Addiction. 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 Yeah. In my experience of working with high performers, generally when you go deep enough, they are, what drives them is really a deep dissatisfaction that it's like a thirst that can't be quenched. Mm. And it tracks back pretty much almost always to one or both of their parents not showing them that they were satisfied with who they are and what they did. Mm. And, And ultimately them feeling unloved by that parent. So then really underneath it all, it's, it's just, they're just searching for love. They're just striving mm. to get, you know, that that acknowledgement, that love, but it manifests in a completely different way as an adult. It's just, oh, on to the next thing. I'm just going to, you know, I'll, underneath it, I'll, I'll, I'll get it once I get there, but it never comes. Mm. But yeah, yeah, but coming back to what you, um, what you asked there, um, I think what's, what's really beautiful about the experience that um, that I guess I get the opportunity to create because it's different with every single person because every single person is unique and it's, it's a deeply personal experience for each individual. And there are always surprises for everyone because a beautiful part of the experience is getting to experience, I guess, music that's meaningful to you in a completely, mm-hmm. in a way that you've probably not done so before, in mm-hmm. a much deeper way. You know, actually, when we're when I spend time with people doing this, you know, well, it's it's never exactly the same. There's, I guess, a framework to the experience, but actually, in there, it's about being in flow, being present, you know, dealing with what shows up. I mean, that's kind of that's intuitive coaching, really. Um, but yeah, everyone always has some kind of surprise. And, and we don't, because even before the experience, everyone has homework. So they need to go away, come up with a playlist of songs that mean something to them, at least two or three. One song representing a painful experience. One song representing a loving or connected experience. And one song representing a joyful experience. So then they send me those songs 24 hours in advance of us meeting. So I, that's really just for me to kind of get them all queued up. And then when we get together, we, we just go with the flow. I've had experiences where we've not even listened to any of the songs that they sent because other songs have come up in the moment. Because what I'm always looking for in particular is where's, where's the resistance? Hmm. You know, follow follow the resistance because resistance is really just a sign that you're about to make a breakthrough. But it takes 
uh, a lot of trust, a level of comfort and safety, and, and a space that's safe enough to allow someone to lean into that resistance and push through it to get to the other side, to get to then that kind of mm. promised land of new wisdom <clears throat> and knowledge beyond the, the adversity that they kind of see in front of them immediately. Mm. And that's, that's amazing. Like it's, I mean, coaching as a practice, um, and I guess my version of it, it's, it's sacred. Yeah. It is. It is. People are trusting you with their, yeah. their deepest, darkest secrets, um, their deepest desires, the things that they have never probably told another mm. human being or even allowed themselves to say out loud yeah. for fear of judgment or mm. that it might not ever happen or, you know, all the kind of, all the mad reasons that we concoct but yeah, yeah, yeah. to keep us safe, you know? I'm really glad you said that. That is a, that's always a concern. Any coach that you talk to, it's like, can I really trust this person? It always comes up. And then about five minutes of talking to a potential coach, you know, pretty fast. <laughs> Definitely. And in my experience, I know part of my gift, and I say this with humility because I know from experience, you know, this is me. I, I, I just show up as me, like, this is me. This is what everybody oh, yeah. gets. And, but there's also this kind of like, um, I came across this term recently, ambivert. Oh. So an ambivert is someone who finds balance between being both an extrovert and an introvert. Mm. And that, cause that's me, that for me, even in the, even in, you know, Disco Dave, the name, Disco to me is the, <laughs> yeah. is the extrovert, the high vibe, you know, version of me. And Dave is the, is the introverted, the more quiet mm. energy, the nurturing energy, the, the that creative <clears throat> space. Um, and I'm absolutely both. But because I show up as me, I'm not wearing any mask. I'm not trying to pretend to be someone I'm not. It means that when people spend time with me, they can meet me at that exact same level. They don't have to wear mm. any of their masks. Yeah. And what a beautiful gift that is, you know, because how often yeah, are people yeah, yeah. wandering around, particularly in their work, yeah, you know, yeah. trying to authentically be a version of themselves that isn't really them. Oh, it, it's, it, yeah, it breaks my heart. People, Co-workers uh, in previous jobs, I'm, I, you know, ever since James and I started this com company, we've both become unemployable by anyone anywhere. So, <laughs> but before that, I was always trying to find how do we get people to drop their mask around me? How do how do I get them to be who they are so we can accomplish the things we're supposed to be doing? And I could never figure out. Uh, but yeah, that, that's super important that people be able to drop their mask. Definitely. Especially so I, if you're uh, you're working with high performing people in your business, you know that whatever they do on site, it's going to filter down to everybody else in the company. Yeah. So, and I mean, for me, anyone who is involved in some kind of helping profession, the greatest gift that you can give is is your presence, your attention. Yeah. That, that ability prov to provide such a safe space to someone to just be themselves yeah. without any of that judgment, fear, expectations, and so on and so on and so on. Like that's, and that's part of the privilege that I feel every single day in what I do because mm -hmm. I, and I never ever take it for granted. I say this all the time. You know, what I do yeah. is, is so joyful for me. It's so, it's the thing that I absolutely love. I found my thing, but also people are sharing with me things that they just are not sharing with mm -hmm. anyone else. Yeah. And that's amazing. Yeah. Like to hold that. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. And we, yeah, we need more people in the world 
doing this. It's a fact, you know? Me oh, yeah, I mean, we, we get to do it in a different way than you, different mm. application. It's, sometimes it's like holding this gigantic elephant or ostrich egg. I know elephants don't have a gigantic ostrich egg. And you're like, you got to be so careful with this thing. Yeah. It's, it's really an honor to be able to handle it. So I, I do have a, uh, a question. This is my brain jumping tracks again. Cool. If I tell you my favorite song, I'm wondering what that says about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's 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 go there. Blue Oyster Cult, go go Godzilla. Mm. Tell you what, let's do something fun live <laughs> right now. Blue Oyster Cult. James, James's favorite is Queen, but we won't mention that. And <laughs> what's the song? What's the song? Godzilla. Godzilla, right. Let me read the lyrics because when you hear the lyrics to a song, it's very, very different to just hear in the music. So let me let me just read this out. You 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 put a plane with me here? Let's do it. Yeah? Okay. So here we go. With a purposeful grimace and a terrible sound, he pulls the spitting high tension wires down. Helpless people on a subway train scream bug-eyed as he looks in on them. He picks up a bus and he throws it back down as he wades through the buildings toward the center of town. Oh no, they say, he's got to go. Go, go, Godzilla, yeah. Oh no, there goes Tokyo. Go, go, Godzilla. Yeah. Oh no, they say he's got to go. Go, go, Godzilla. Yeah. Oh no, there goes Tokyo. Go, go, Godzilla. Yeah. Godzilla. Godzilla. Ringy news. Oh, mushy. I. Oh, man, I'm going to mess up. Is that some Japanese verse? Japanese verse there. Yeah. But it repeats. And then, oh, no, there goes Tokyo. Go, go, Godzilla, yeah. History shows again and again how nature points out the folly of men. Godzilla. History shows again and again how nature points out the folly of men. Godzilla. And that repeats a couple more times. That's for the uh, guitar and drum solos are in there when they're doing the repeat. What did you notice as I was reading those lyrics? It's actually kind of dark. <laughs> it's almost a social commentary. Okay. How does that, how do the lyrics relate to your experience? I have loved the monsters, all the giant monsters since I was a little kid. Yeah. I started with Dracula, Wolfman, and all that, and then I discovered King Kong and Godzilla and Rodan. Just, I've always loved those. I love building the model kits. I love, yeah. When I started doing a little bit of art of my own, doing my own pictures of them. And, and yeah, I kind of like the whole uh, voice or cult just singing out about. I'm not sure what that song was a metaphor or if they were just being spastic goofballs, but it's just a really fun song. The guitars, the drums, you know, everybody on there, they're obviously just having a great time. Mm. And were you having a great time in the kind of, in the memories of that experience? Yeah, yeah, because I first heard that. um, I mean, they were were a big hit before my, before I hit high school. They were already on the downslope. But, uh, my brother got a hold of one of their records and we played that endlessly. We thought, this is the greatest song. This is far better than doing homework or going to school. <laughs> it's far better than watching you get a boring TV. Awesome. And then, uh, you know, we were living on the Mexican border at the time in a pretty crappy town. So we thought, wait a minute, there's another world out there. Mm. Interesting. So how does that song express you, who you are today? Um, I'm still the kind of person that people, particularly in a business context, I'll, I'll be very professional. I'm still me. Mm. 
but I do things like I'm, I'm more I'm more careful with the kinds of terminology I use. And I'm more careful about trying to figure out someone's communication style as a, as a meeting is going on, those sorts of things. And inevitably, something comes out of my mouth where someone will go, what the hell is wrong with you? So I feel like, well, I'm, I'm Godzilla. <laughs> That's what's wrong with me. <laughs> and they never mean that in a bad way, which is the good part. They never say that, like, angrily. They say it because they're laughing. They're like, what? <clears throat> James probably remembers a few of those conversations when we met. <laughs> it, it's just a really fascinating um, subject. And um, it was really interesting hearing that little bit of coaching there and, yeah. and Mike's memories. And uh, a lot to think about. It, 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 it was kind of like maybe it was, maybe it was the. It was what the music did. It, it was a transformational kind of experience of listening to the album as sort of a door, as a doorway out, or kind of like like a little trip out of of Mike's sort of school and a kind of a mix, kind of a Mexican border kind of town. It was a little doorway to, and then it was almost like your own sort of dream or fantasy uh, perhaps. And then that kind of tied in with Godzilla and pulling down buildings and whatnot, which is again, it's sort of a fantasy. It's kind of a make belief is uh, sort of, isn't it? So, uh, uh, so, so some really interesting, uh, I would imagine Mike, that that'd be fast, such a fascinating journey for you and Dave to explore a little, uh, sort of a little bit more, wouldn't it? And I think from my perspective, Although I'm going to have to apologise that I am going to have to leave for a prior appointment in a couple of minutes, but but I think from my perspective, it's also given a doorway of how Dave works with clients as well, and really the power. And even within just five to seven minutes, um, imagine spending like thirty to sixty minutes exploring that mic. It'd oh be, yeah, uh, it'd be it'd be super powerful, wouldn't it? Uh, especially as you said, you, you have those three different songs for three different emotional journeys, and mm. um, really, really powerful. Yeah, I really wanted people, uh, our listeners, to hear you do that a little bit. So I'm glad we got to, to uh, have some fun with it. Thank you. But, you no, know, I appreciate it. It's, <laughs> it's it is fun. That's the thing. It's it's fun, but it's yeah. <clears throat> it's also um, and because I'm I'm mindful about kind of in this kind of in this space that we're sharing right now, not going in too deep, right? Bec yeah. Because really to get the most out of the experience um part of the invitation i have for anyone who does this with me is to really play full out is yeah. to yeah. just be completely yeah. open to feeling whatever feelings they are no matter how difficult yeah. or challenging they might be like i've i mean i was um i've been i've been recording some conversations recently with people who've done this with me as uh because I want to create a podcast of people telling the stories of the experience and the impact that it's Brilliant. had to start getting Brilliant. this out there more. Brilliant. And, um, and Jerry that I was speaking to this morning, we had an amazing experience together. Oh, and it was only recent. It was in December and he'd literally just lost his cousin, like within the, I think it was like 48 hours and it was really close. And what he shared with me was that, what we did together, the fact that he, a, he showed up and didn't just hide was beautiful. And I kind of mm. acknowledged him for mm. that. But what we did together and what we shared was so cathartic for him. So it allowed him to grieve in the moment in a way that, and, and, and process the experience and the emotions in a way that he probably wouldn't have done otherwise. And it was a, an absolute gift for us both and so beautiful to experience and so honoring to know that, you know, he trusted me that much with that level of raw emotion and grief. Um, and, you know, we, I mean, we cried, we laughed, we danced. I mean, that's, that's the kind of, that's the experience I, I look to create every time. It's, it's a full range experience allowing us to experience the full range of ourselves, but just in the space of, you know, what's typically two hours that I take, you know, each client on this kind of adventure with, but it's, I mean, every time it's amazing, like truly amazing. Um, 
And it blows me away every time as well. Just the impact that it has. It's incredible. It feels like as well, it's like this gift I've been given, sort of bestowed upon me. It's channeled through me. And I'm like this, the steward of it, the custodian. It's my responsibility to nurture it, take care of it, and but get it out into the world and allow more people to, I guess, experience it, but really experience themselves. Man, that's beautiful, Dave. So do you have any books or anything new coming out that people should be looking for? Not any books, no, but um, I I guess there's an invitation. Um, yeah. Because I, I really just work with people one-to-one. I am on the verge of turning this into a live audience experience. And I'm in conversations with um, some people involved in the festival scene in the UK. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, I think down the line, there probably will be a book, but I'm not ready yet. I think I still want to have more experiences to then build up a kind of book of experience. Because what's interesting, when I have done research around this, and really it's research around the intersection between music and neuroscience and, and possibility, there's actually very little out there. Right. Like, like really, not a lot. I, there's one book um, called, I think it's called Your Brain on Music by a guy called Daniel Levitan, who's a musician, an academic. And, and there's some really cool stuff from his research. And one fact that I love is that in the research that he's done, they've discovered that when you, when you listen to music that you enjoy under a brain scan, literally your entire brain lights up mm. every known region of the brain is stimulated by music that you love so what that means is that's really cool is music literally expands our awareness like love and enjoyment and an experience expands our awareness it allows us to see things that we could not previously see in terms of possibilities and that is amazing. Like, what a gift that is for, you know, people who want to solve complex problems. I mean, that it just explains a it lot. blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. When, when we really have to solve something very difficult, mm. I'll put on the I'll put on the headset and listen to classical music. Mm. That's yeah. my thinking music. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, we've. I think we've. Part of what drives me with this as well, I mean, a, a big part of what drives me is is really to create more loving connection in the world because it's the thing I fear losing the most because it's the thing I lost when I was growing up mm. because my family broke down, the whole family unit broke down, parents separated. It came as a complete shock. We went from having a beautiful childhood full of connection to just being totally disconnected because we had no place to call home, physical place, because we moved around. Our place to call home was our family unit, my dad, my mom, my sisters and me. And that was taken away. So, and that was the, the, that experience was the deepest pain of my life. And I never, ever want to repeat that again. I'm taking all the lessons of what not to do, applying them to, you know, myself right now as a father, as a leader, as a servant, as someone who, you know, is music and love and, and just wants to create more of that in the world. And, um, yeah, I think we've all... We all deserve this. We all deserve love. We all deserve connection. We all deserve to discover a sense of purpose and the beautiful energy that is so sustainable and allows us to then create things that we didn't even think were possible. Yeah, 100% agreement. My, my driver is to spread as much joy and happiness as I can. Awesome. Yes. Right? In the business world, uh, James and I do that by helping companies not run out of money. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the mechanical application, but really we're like, you know, take the risks, spread the joy, be happy, make connections. These things, they build. Yeah, well, I mean, in the context of business, <coughs> money is, 
is really a mechanism to allow us to take risks. Yeah, yeah, it's the gas, it's the, uh, oh, excuse me, it's the petrol in your car. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but you can't create from uh, from the energy of stress and responsibility. So money, it allows us that safety and comfort that allows us to then be creative. Yeah, so what exactly. you do is is beautiful. Um, sorry about the camera issues. <laughs> At least you can still hear me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so that is our first interview with Dave Wynn. We're going to have him back again. And uh, any parting words, Dave? I've, I'll put a link down below for how folks can get a hold of you. Yeah, I mean, the best way at the moment is LinkedIn. I'm in the process of... Um, updating my my own personal profile um there'll be a website and things coming down the line but it's not something i'm prioritizing right now but um i actually would love to um leave you with a with a quote that i love from the late great wayne dyer which is very simply don't die with your music still in you Oh, oh, man, that's great. <laughs>